of skills they are, they are looking for. They are not only for civil, by the way, also they cater for mechanical and electrical and other disciplines in engineering. Uh, me as a dean of, enge of uh, an engineering uh, faculty, we, we really uh, encourage when we see the industry are around and uh, we really look for their feedback and their input. And just now we, I was talking to my colleague that they must be part of our advisory board to advise us on the curriculum and the way forward. So uh, without any further delay, uh, again, I welcome everyone, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, a, a nice presentation here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Khaled. Um, to start us off, we'd like to introduce you visually to the world of Sanral by means of a video. They say success doesn't just happen, that it happens by design. It's about seeing the bigger dream, pushing the envelope, and of course, good old hard work. This is what we're built on. At Sunra, we're about more than just changing our country's landscape with bitumen and concrete. We're about changing our people's lives, opening new routes that will connect people to people, businesses to businesses, and workers to job opportunities. From Messina to Mabatu, Springbok to Saldana, Khansbai to Richards Bay, and anything in between, the men and women of Sunral work to build South Africa's future. Our national roads carry more than 70% of long distance road freight, contributing directly to economic growth for South Africa and neighboring countries. Over the past five years, our focus has been on maintaining our road network, keeping it in tip-top condition. The N2 Wild Coast is one of Sunral's most ambitious projects. It connects no less than four provinces, the Western Cape, Eastern Cape, KwaZulu-Natal and Mpumalanga. When finished, it will open up the coastal strip between Port St. John's and Port Edward and provide a faster link to Durban, East London and Kabecha, improving the lives of those who live and work along the East Coast. When partnered with the majestic 580 metre Msikaba Bridge, which is scheduled to be the second longest span crossing ever built in Africa, the Wild Coast is set to truly come alive. Just 50 kilometers outside of They say success doesn't just happen, that it happens by design. It's about seeing the bigger dream, pushing the envelope, and of course, good old hard work. This is what we're built on. At Sunra, we're about more than just changing our country's landscape with bitumen and concrete. So decidedly the technology gods are not with us today. So we are going to go on to the um, presentation and hopefully 
if we're able to, we will definitely show you that video at the end, which is very, um, very informative and very colorful. Um, and I'm sure you would, uh, you'd appreciate seeing it. So if we have time at the end, we'll certainly go back to it. Um, but to start us off, um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Can I have the clicker? Okay. Uh, can you drive for me, please, when I ask for the next slide? <coughs> um, so to start us off, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the SANREL Regional Manager for the Northern Region, Mr. Progress Slata. Now you must know that SANREL is divided into four different regions across South Africa. And this university campus falls within the Northern Region. And Mr. Slata is the senior most person in this region that covers the Northwest, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, as well as Gauteng. So it gives me pleasure to introduce Mr. Flasla to give you an overview of engineering at Sanral. Uh, thank you, Zora. Uh, thank you, Prof. Khaled. Let's see if we can, are we able to get it into presentation mode? Okay, so the cardinal sin of presenting is to have to turn your back to the audience to point on the slides. So I'll try not to do that a lot. I think you have learned that when you were preparing for your presentations. I will try to be quick and to introduce to you the Northern Region, what we do, who we are, the people we work with, some of them are going to be talking to you just now. And then we will also try to at least pick your interest in the work Sunrall does with the hope that some of you in future, you work and you join Sunrall and you contribute your skills to the development of the country. So I am Progress Lattler, as indicated. I'm a professionally registered engineer, which I hope a lot of you also will either be registered as professional, professional engineers, professional technologies, and so on. I think but this presentation will cover some of that. We can go to the next one. All right, so I want to give you a quick context of yeah, we can move if we can. So the northern region is made up of four provinces. It's, um, it will be Hauteng, Pumalanga, the northwest, and of course Limpopo. We manage almost half of the entire national road network. And with me, there's me and there's around 50 engineers I work with and a lot of other people that I also work with to deliver this work. And the, the network, as you would all would imagine, will be in different conditions uh, depending on whether we have owned that road before or whether it was transferred to us over time. At this point, as I'm talking to you, Sanrao is in charge of around 23,000 kilometers. The intention is to transfer around 12,000 additional kilometers to bring our total number to around 35,000 kilometers. There's been discussions to see if we cannot push that barrier a little bit up. But a lot of you who have driven on different roads owned by different authorities in the country, you can tell the differences in the quality of the network if you move from a national road to a provincial road. So these are some of the th reasons why there's a lot of thinking around changing the, or at least transferring a, signif a significant portion of the network to Sandra. So I will, or are we good now? Sorry, progress. Yes. That's fine. We will, we will run it like this one. So I, I hear there are some clever electronic IT students. You will solve, us for, solve this one for us for next time, isn't it? Yes, I, I'll be relying a lot on you. When we are back again here, you will solve this challenge for us. Let's move on. So this is what the network looks like. The ownership model obviously changes. We, we do have a challenge. I think we have around 244 authorities that own roads in South Africa. So that's a very large number of people that have to make decisions about roads. And when you are driving as a driver, you don't really care about this. All you want is to drive on a road that takes you from A to B. But the problem is because so many of us own a portion of the road, 
there is not enough integration in ensuring that we deliver to you a seamless experience when you're traveling on the roads. So this is what they, they look like. And the different colors give you, I think, I don't know if we can reduce the lighting. Maybe it will help a bit. Is it a bit better? Yes. Students are very polite, Prof. They don't tell you when things are not coming clearly. They're like, I will endure through. That's very kind of you. Okay. So this is what it looks like. And all those roads are owned by different people. We own, we can move to the next one. South Africa owns around, or at least it is around 750,000 kilometers of road network. So it's quite a large number of roads. We were, when this slide was made, we were around number 11 in the world. But if you compare South Africa to the juggernauts of road ownership, USA is, what, 6 million. So 750,000 is a lot maybe in the African context. If you try to play at the world stage where we need to actually be playing, it's not as much when you compare. But you see, there's a lot of other countries there that really own a substantial road network. The challenge we have is a significant portion of the road network that I just mentioned to you is gravel. So it would be good if it was 750,000 uh, surface roads, but it is not. Okay, move to the next one. That's where the challenge is, and that's where a lot of you are going to play up in. So if you look at this slide, and I will try not to be blocking my props here, you will see Sandra, the 22 has now increased because we are getting more network. But what I really want you to look at is 158 of the 750 is paved. Almost 600,000 is gravel. So the 750 is no longer impressive, is it, because of that problem. So we need a lot of clever people, clever minds to solve this problem. And a lot of it has to do with the ability to fund roads. So a lot of problems will boil down to money as you, as you pick up as we go. Because we, if we don't change this, what it means is if you are in a, a farmer and you are producing produce that needs to get to a port to be exported, it will get damaged before you get it to port. If you are transporting anything that is sensitive, it will get damaged because you are doing it on a gravel road. And even more, if you own a car, and a lot of you either you own or are going to own a car very soon, there are what we call user costs. They will go up because of the quality of the roads you drive in. So this is a really big problem if you are in a developing country because you start to add up or accumulate additional costs that people in the developing, developed world will avoid. We can move to the next one. So I will now try to see if I can pick up my speed a little bit. But you ask me questions later on. So for Sandro, we've spoken about 23,000. But if you break them down, you realize that a lot of you are aware of the ETO problem, of the ETO discussions in the media and the challenges around ETO. Now, I want to give you context so that next time someone raises an ETO debate with you, you can give them context. Because there's a lot of people speaking confidently in the public domain with very little knowledge. So I want you to, co to help me correct that. So when we look at the, the infrastructure we own, we, to replace it, just Sunrose not network, not, not the country, Sunrose, you need around half a trillion rand. So that's quite a, a substantial amount of money. So it's a, it's a very large asset we own. Now, 87% of the network is funded from treasury through allocations. It's none told. You don't pay a toll at all to drive on that network. 87%. Of the 13% that remains, 7% is managed through where you, you see us collecting tolls through our operators. For example, what you see here on the N1. We would go through Hasmi and so on and all the other plazas. So we collect around 7% of that. Then 6% is through concessions. Some of you know the N3TC on the N3 to Deben, the N4. If you go up in Hauteng, N4 towards Maputo, that's with Trek, N4 towards Botswana, that's with Bakwena, and so on. Now, of the 7% where we collect toll, do you want to guess how much of that is ETOs as a percentage? Does anyone want to guess? 
Make a guess. It's a guess. Maybe you think of that 7%, maybe you think 5% is Zitos, eh? What do you think? Less than 1%. So, of the 100% network we own, a lot of the noise is on less than 1%. Actually, it's 201 kilometers. That's the entire network of the GFIP issue, or GFIP network that we spend a lot of time in the media talking about. So there have been millions and millions of runs spent engaging on less than 1% of the network. So if you, you, are, you obviously think of the efficiency and the thinking around that. And a lot of decisions are going to be made about the future of road funding based on less than 1% of the network. And that's where the problem is. And I showed you a couple of slides earlier where we need to fix or we need to surface a lot of roads. But if we are going to make a lot of our decisions based on 1% of the network, we will, there's a, a saying that you, what, you miss the trees for the forest, isn't it? Or, or something to that effect. You are focusing on the minor. Pennywise, pound foolish. You focus on the minor things and you lose the big picture. We can move to the next slide. So I hope this gives you an idea that sometimes when people raise this ito thing, don't think about it, about just ito. Think about how much effort we are spending on a very small portion of the network. Okay, so this is how we are managed. We report to the minister, we have a board of directors, we have a CEO, and we have a lot of staff. It was 475 a while back, we will increase it over a thousand. So we are going to be recruiting. A lot of you are going to find a home in Sandra because we do need a lot of technical skills. We have, I think the, one of the things that distinguishes us as a road authority is the number of technical staff we, we employ. So we'll be looking forward to employ you. Let's, let's move forward. I will try to pick up the pace now. We can just go to the next one. So we build a lot of things. So this is one of the bridges we've built or we're building in the World Coast. Some of you are aware there are two key bridges. There's the Mskaba and then there's the Mtendu. And this is the infrastructure we spend in. And if I was a lecturer, I would give you an assignment to find your, what you have studied in there. Find a piece of what you have already accumulated knowledge in terms of where it would contribute to the building of that bridge. You realize that you start to bring in a lot of expertise that you require. There will be lighting, so you need people who know how to do electrical engineering. There will be, there's a lot of moving joints and so on, so you need a lot of people who understand mechanical engineering. You need people who understand structural engineering and so on. And you need people who can build the actual road. So a lot of the infrastructure we build Although we build roads, it brings a lot of engineering work streams together and specialists to deliver on the projects we do. We can move to the next one. So we build, obviously, the bridges. We build a lot of highways. You've seen the Ibikluta in Deben. You've seen a lot of other interchanges we have built. There will be new interchanges that we are going to be building in Hauteng, and you'll start to see them once we sort out the funding issue. But in other areas, we are building a lot of these this infrastructure. Some of you who have traveled Europe and the West, you will know that our infrastructure is next to none. We build the best infrastructure, point, point blank. You will realize this when you travel, that it's very comparable when you're driving anywhere you're driving. The infrastructure you have in South Africa, especially at the national level, is at par with all the other infrastructure you get there. You can move to the next one. And so we do all these roads that we do and we do a lot of road safety. You are aware, and I hope, if you are not aware, you'll be aware now. In South Africa, every year, we lose around 12,000, between 12,000 and 14,000 people to road accidents. And we are now focusing a lot on engineering roads or safe roads. But the problem is a lot of it is human behavior. So I hope all of you, when you get on your car, you think about those statistics. Because all those 12,000 people I'm talking about, are people who left home and thought they would come back home, but they didn't because either they were speeding or someone was speeding or someone was ignoring the rules of the road. The majority, in between 87 to 94% of the causes of the accidents is human behavior. So it's not the road, it's how people are behaving. Okay, move to the next one. Um, so safe roads are an issue about almost 50% of people who die on roads are pedestrians. So that's another key issue. So we spend a lot of time building infrastructure that separates pedestrians from roads. 
you would know if you were to read the National Roads Act that pedestrians are not supposed to be walking on the road anyway, but on national roads, but they end up being there, so you need to accommodate them. And we also do tunnels, there are a lot of tunnels. Some of you have driven on some of our roads, you see the tunnels we've built in Hauteng. There are tunnels up if you go on the N1 into Limpopo, on the N4 and so on. So we do a lot of tunnels. Um, there's the, I think the Huguenot, one of the largest tunnels we have, around what, 3.9 kilometers long in the Cape Town there. So we do a lot of this, we can move to the next one. And then we, we also do, some of you have driven through the N1, you have had to pay tolls. I will have a few slides to just talk to you about the complex information systems behind a symbol toll collection process. So I'll come back to this, we can move to the next one. Yeah, so this we do. We have got chairs around universities where we invest in, in, in studying certain areas of interest to us. Uh, in the last year, we went out to do a re request for proposals on a lot of research areas that we want further research to be done. A lot of PhD students and professors were able to submit proposals and we're evaluating and we're getting them to research certain areas or topics that we want. So a lot of manuals you are going to see and use, especially in the road building space, are developed by Sandro through Sandro Research. Obviously with partners with other departments and so on. But we lead that. We lead the innovation side and the research side on the manuals that we, we, we actually are developing. Right now, we have actually been developing a TRH 24 for the use of nanotechnology in road building. So you see it out there. So this is the leadership we try to bring because remember what we said, the work South Africa does is at par with the rest of the world. And in some areas, we lead the world, and they are following our lead in terms of that. We can move to the next one. So we spoke about innovation with smart mobility. I'll speak a little bit again to this. There's an app where now you can, if you, are, you download the app, and you're driving, and you pick up an issue on the road, the portal, you can take a picture. You can route it through to Sandra to say there's a problem here. Can you get someone to come fix it? In the back office, it will identify who owns the road. It will send a job instruction to them and to get them to fix the road. And then it will ask them for proof that the road has been fixed. And it will, it will aggregate that information back and close that particular job instruction. So there's a lot of work we are doing there. The app also allows you to update your total account and to even park in some malls and so on. But we are leading again in smart mobility and developing technology to make your life easier as a road user. We, we can move. All right, so obviously there's a lot of network management, asset management systems, and there are a lot of other systems in the background that we employ to make sure that we, at any point in time, are aware of the condition of our network and the interventions that are required. So this is what we do, and these systems are there for all the infrastructure that we built. We can move on. And this is important. You, you will realize every now and then you get a question to say, uh, and this happens a lot, I think, in, the, in our context in, developing, in the developing world, that you have a limited amount of budget that is available to you. So one of the questions that you if you come to an interview in Sandra, we might ask you is to say, between OPEX and CAPEX, OPEX is operational expenditure, CAPEX is capital expenditure. If you have been given a certain amount of money, what are you going to prioritize? Do you do CAPEX and build new roads and resurface all that network I spoke to you about, or do you do something different? So that is the kind of challenges we will want you to solve. But maybe to answer this for you, when you have a limited amount of budget, you always do OPEX. You do maintenance first, not CAPEX. This is the, the way, the best practice to approach it, because it's better to preserve what you have than to build new infrastructure. And CAPEX costs a lot more than maintenance does. And if you delay maintenance, you can pay up to 17 times more to, to correct that damage to the infrastructure than you would have paid had you intervened at the right time. So some of these questions will come as you engage with Sandra and, and you then at least have an idea of how to solve them. We can move on. Okay. So the app I spoke about, there's an operation of Alazonke. We are integrating now on the Sandra network, provincial network, and local network to make sure you have good access. So this app on Google, 
uh, what do you call it, Google, what's that app store for Google? Google Play, yes, and on the Apple App Store, you'll get it, you'll be able to download it and then install it on your phone, and then there's a lot, it's, it's user friendly, so it'll be easy for you to use it. We can move on, all right, okay, so we can move on. So I've already spoken to you about the northern, northern region. There are four regions, and there are different colors there. So we are in the north where that marker is. We can move to the next one. We do have our offices all around. We have different offices in different places where we are best. We can move to the next one. Um, this is more or less the network in just a calculation of how much is in the northern region. We can move to the next one. And this, this is an example of what you can do if you have uh, integrated transport information systems. So if you, and some of you have studied asset management as part of your training, they, there's a lot of, uh, you obviously need hardware to get your data. So you need instrumentation to get your data. You need software to process the data. And you need to up, output it. You need some policies and guidelines on how to use the data and so on. So this is an example of if you, we, have, we have a truck that, that goes, drives on the road, picks up a lot of data on the condition of the road, and then it puts that data back to us. We run some clever algorithms, and it tells us the condition of the network. So it, it begins to tell you we know how much we spend. We know how many SMEs there are, where they are. We know how the money is distributed and where it is. And sometimes there will be even other output about the condition index of the road and so on that we will actually be able to get. We can move. All right. And in the end, we are able to demonstrate or give you information that gives an idea of where we are, what we have done, the people we have impacted. Because in addition to building better roads, you need to create employment. You need to empower SMMEs. You need to train them. And you need them involved in the work that one will be doing. We can go to the next one. And there's a lot of focus within Sandra on around transformation, making sure that we bring in uh, those historically disadvantaged to work on our projects and to ensure that even as we allocate work in the construction industry, we also balance it out so that you have a mix of companies being able to work with us. And this is what it, this slide is about. Move. We can move. So the presentation is long. That's why I'm picking up a little bit of pace. So I hope some of you, and Origin is here. He's the project manager for this project, have been to the N1. I hope you've driven on the N1, and you've seen the work that they are doing there. So I hope Origin will speak to a bit to it. It's, it's around concrete repair. So this is what they are doing. It's around, say, 53 or so kilometers between him and the lead coach, Mangazo. They are the engineers running these two projects and they are doing repair work. So the way you think about repairing concrete pavements is a, is a lot different from the approach you would take if you were repairing flexible pavements. And some of you know the difference between what I've just said. So it would be good to, if you have not done it, to have a look there when you drive there. Have an idea of what people are doing. How does it relate to what you have been taught in class? And how do you apply it in a practical way to solve practical problems? So there's a lot of that that is going on in terms of dealing with concrete. You realize that there's a lot of inf uh, equipment that you cannot use when you're dealing with this. We can move to the next one. And so recently we had to commission the Musina Interchange. This is what it looks like. So again, designed by South Africans, built by South Africans, world-class infrastructure. We can move to the next one. Um, and this is what it's the, the, that place looks like. If you were to drive there, you'll be able to see the investment Sandra has done and has put into this. And a lot of you will be helping us in terms of uh, delivering on this. OK, move. I want to get to a few slides that I think could be good. All right. All right. OK, uh, it's fine. We also recently commissioned the Carino interchange on the N4. Some of you might have been there. It's quite world class. We, this is just giving you an, an example of the accidents we have to deal with. Even though our infrastructure is the best, there's a lot of people who die on the roads. And sometimes you have to find unconventional means to intervene in terms of what you do to make it possible for people to still travel on a road. 
So we've done some work on the N1 crown scope. When you drive to Limpopo, you'll be able to see some of this work that we've done. We can move. All right, so the idea uh, with that place is the road is four lanes and it's undivided like you see on the left. And the people make you turns, they do illegal overtaking and so on. And we lose a lot of people there. So we are going to do a project to move the, the cross section from the left to the right. So this is in the end what we will have on the N1 North. And this will cost um, taxpayers probably close to 10 billion. So the cost of people not obeying the laws of the road is going to cost us a significant amount of money to reconstruct the road in this particular way, which is much safer and which prevents u turns. Okay, move to the next one. All right, so this, this could be interesting for if you have a car or are planning to own a car. If you drive on the N1 North, you will see cameras and you will see a sign that is SASOD. -S that's average speed over distance. We are finalizing the ability to issue tickets. So what it does is you pass the cameras, it reads your number plate, it goes to Inatis, it gets all your information from Inatis, we, who owns the car and so on. You pass the next camera, we know the spacing of the cameras, we can calculate your average speed, it's a simple, simple calculation. If you are above the average speed limit in that area, we tell the cop who is maybe a few kilometers after the second camera to say there's a, a vehicle, a, a polo coming to you. Its average speed is 200. Please stop that person. So they will stop you and you produce your cool drink. They will tell you the system already caught you so there's no more cool drink. So this is what we are going with the technology. And so, you, so the, we have this joint information system able to pull from all the different servers, the information about the vehicles that are running. If you are using duplicated number plates, we pick you up. If you are using false number plates, we pick you up. If you have no number plates, we will catch you still. So this is what we will be deploying countrywide because there are too many people over speeding and breaking the rules of the road. So you now need to use technology to make that part a lot difficult. So just be aware, very soon you'll start to hear these announcements about this system, it's being deployed. I think some of you have been to Cape Town, you have seen some of this already in you. Some of you have been to Deben as well. We can move to the next one. And so on toll roads as well, maybe, yeah, this is information, I think we'll share the slides so that colleagues can go through them. The idea here is when you read the slides, you realize that what you do when you approach a target, you, you get there, you're in your I don't know, your nice vehicle, your Mercedes, they tell you it's five rand, you pay your five rand, you get your ticket, you drive. Or if you have an e-tag, you get to a tow road, it just reads the tag and it opens the boom and you go. So a lot of people never really understand what is happening behind the scenes. So think of it this way. If you have a skeleton there sitting there collecting money, every time a truck or a lorry comes in, they will simply say, because you know the tariffs are different, isn't it, for these uh, vehicle types. So they will simply say, for the, this lorry, uh, they will say, ah, it's a private car. So let's say private car is five rand, lorries are 20 rand. They will then say to the driver, give me 20 rand. The driver gets 20 rand. Maybe this person has printed their own receipt on the side. They give him a fake receipt for 20 rand. In the system, they put five rand. And then the driver goes and you have the money and, and, and this person will become rich in a very, very short time. Because some of these targets can produce, can process around 200 cars an hour. So if you are able to do that a lot, you will get rich very quickly, isn't it? And by the time we catch you, you will be quite rich. You will be at Conga there, you know, showing off to everyone that you are, you are rich. So to prevent that, there is a lot of technology that you need to make it very difficult for someone to steal. So when you approach a tall gunner, this you don't see, but in the background, we've got piezo electric loops on the ground. It can, based on the spacing of your tires, tell us what type of vehicle that is. We've got cameras that also look at the vehicle and tell us what type of vehicle it is, and it classifies it. Then we have another, we've got almost like, it's almost like radar. Next, you will just see vertical bars. You don't even know what they are about. They are there to read the vehicle again. 
So we would have three systems, all just classifying the vehicle to tell us exactly what type of car you are driving and what tariff you should be charged. If the clever cashier says a lorry is a small car, the system flags it, it immediately. It goes to a supervisor in the back office to say there's a conflict. The system is saying this is a truck, the person is saying it's a car. Please look at the camera before the person goes through. The, it, automatically the supervisor will drop this report, so will check and will then confirm the classification of the vehicle. So we run this and we give this to an operator to run it. But in the background from us, a Sanro, we will then be able to say, based on our classification system, you had 10,000 trucks this month. And because each truck is three rand, we want our 30,000 rand. If you are the operator and your cashiers say you, have, you actually had 9,000 trucks, you have a 3,000 shortfall, that's your problem. From Sanro's side, we want our full money you figure it out, how you recover the losses because of these systems that we run. So these slides just try to explain the contractual relationship between an employer, an operator, and someone whom we call a systems integrator. You need someone with a mechatronic engineering to say you have got a lot of equipment and you've got software in the back and financial software in between that, that does a lot of this work. So I won't go into the details of the slide. But when you have time to read it, you will then start to appreciate the complexity of that simple transaction that allows you to pay a total tariff. We can move to the next one. So this one is again telling you about the technology, telling you about what is there, what is possible, and how we manage it. And how we can, when we want, centralize it in a single command center somewhere in the country. And how we back it up and how we make sure that the information is always available. We can move to the next one. And in addition to these systems, if you go to a website called iTraffic, you'll be able to see, for example, in Hauteng, the cameras that are there, that are live, that track traffic, that track incidents is on the road. So you could be speeding on the freeway, we can see you. We know where you entered the freeway system, we know when you exited, we know your average speed, we know your number plate, we know the car owner, we know a lot of information that we pick up as you drive. So sometimes knowing this helps you when you are making decisions. Because a lot of the time, I think people assume no one knows or no one is, what is really paying attention. But Big Brother is watching. And the information is actually being collected. And you can actually go see on that, on what, on that website to see the information. We can move to the next one. And, and this just gives you an idea of some of the centers we have where we do this monitoring. How we process the information and how we are able, for example, in Houteng, if you have an accident on the freeway, you will see that immediately a tow truck will pitch up and then the police will pitch up and then an ambulance will pitch up. You will assume maybe someone in the traffic saw you and called those people. Not really. We see it, we dispatch them from our command centers. So we've got a lot of people who are working in the background to try and keep you safe. Some, sometimes you hear stories that a lady had a tire puncher on the freeway, they parked. While they are busy trying to call their insurance, someone just pitches up and helps them change a tire. It's, it's because we are watching and we're able to do that dispatching as we monitor traffic. And we're able to, to also use this system for crime fighting. Your car gets hijacked. We pick up where you were hijacked. We sometimes can pick up who was there, and who were there, and where it went, and where it exited. And we're able to also alert those that need to respond to, respond to that hijacking. But we won't give you too much details about that. Just know it's there. OK, let's move to the next one. All right, so when you get to these centers, and maybe in future, we will to arrange some trips of some sort so that we'll see. You will be able to see the people doing the actual work that I just spoke to you about. A whole office with a whole lot of clever people, a whole lot of uh, we are just making sure you are safe on the road. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, I think, okay, yeah, so this is more of the same. You see the number of cameras? It's a, it's a lot of them. It's a lot. Okay, but let's move to the next. Um, and then I spoke a little bit about research and innovation. Obviously, you know there are different models about how you take the research knowledge and convert it into practical uh, use or into practical implementation. There's that Harvard model that we have there. There will be a lot of other models. 
The idea is you start at the left uh, on the pictures, you want to move to the right. So there's a lot of people, and a lot of you are sitting in the audience. You will help the country to move from the left to the right. So a lot of the information you research, the thesis and reports and dissertations you are going to write, the idea is hopefully it doesn't die there. That some of this knowledge that you generate can be used and it can be taken forward for the benefit of the country. You can move to the next one. All right, so this is just, uh, remember I spoke to you about ethos, and I spoke to you about a lot of people who say a lot of things. Now, because a lot of people have said a lot of things in the media, and a lot of decisions are now being made, we have a funding issue that we need as a country to deal with. So the funding gap that keeps increasing means the quality of the network or the roads that you're going to drive on will be poor. How many of you have driven on the R21 in Houghton recently? Or you have not been up there, you don't want to be bothered there? Okay, I see one person. Okay, you guys need to travel more. Okay. You know the condition? Yes. Yes, yes. The, re the reason that road is like that is because of this. We were ready from Sandra since May to start construction. We are only now able to start construction because we have now been given a special permission, a special amount of money to do that work. But the ETO portfolio is under strain, it's under strain because of GFIP. So GFIP needs to be resolved so that we have enough money. Once we have enough money, we can continue funding. But a lot of the problems we have will come down to funding. So while some of these arguments are emotional and make sense emotionally, from a practical sense of view, you may want to really think about the user pay principle because that works. And we need to be able to build the right infrastructure for you to be able to drive on. So we will be repairing the R21 very soon. So you will see a contractor now and so on. But it's just an example of what happens when there's this conflict around funding. Okay, move on to the next one. Okay, I am done, I think. This is just an idea that we need to talk to you so that you also give us feedback where we can do better. We need support, obviously. A lot of these things you hear in the media, sometimes you need to take a stand because a lot of it will affect you directly. Whether you say something or you don't, if we don't get the infrastructure to the right standard, it will affect you because you will pay more for your repair costs, you will pay more through tires, you will pay more through a lot of things. And uh, a lot of the things I've already discussed with you is covered or summarized in the slide. So we'll be looking forward to a lot of you joining Sandra and joining other roads authorities in the country and I think moving the country forward. Thank you, Zora. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. Progress Latha, the regional manager of the northern region for Sanral. Um, we can move to the next slide. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce one of those young engineers, project managers, uh, who was mentioned, uh, Origin Sengwane, to tell you a little bit about his journey, uh, the journey of a young engineer. Uh, morning, everyone. Yes, as they have introduced me, my name is Origin Sangwane. I'm a project manager at Sanra. So I'll be giving you uh, my experience, my journey, and the works that we do as an engineer. So basically, just to give you a background about myself, uh, I studied at the University of Pretoria, where I completed a BEng in civil engineering, cum laude, and then from there I went and did an honors, transportation engineering, and currently pursuing an MEng at UP as well. And I'm extra registered as well as a professional. I'm a professional engineer. Okay, move on. So yeah, I had my regional manager saying I must tell you about the project. I thought he was going to talk about it. But anyway, in summary, you've probably seen this Venn diagram. So our work as engineers, we need to make sure that we ensure sustainability, meaning that we meet the needs of today, yet not being detrimental to the environment so that the future generations are able to also uh, have a, a, a world or a country to live in. So in summary, uh, you might have heard the West talking about climate change and uh, all the things that are happening where now we are switching to battery cars or electric cars, hydrogen vehicles, etc. So from our side, I think once you start working, you start realizing that 
you actually reduce the amount of engineering that you do and you do a lot in other aspects where there's a lot of factors that you need to consider. Uh, from an economic point of view, if you look at Africa as a whole, most of the fastest growing economies, there's one thing in particular that they are all doing, investing in infrastructure. So infrastructure development is key in ensuring that you are able to increase the economy of a country. And I think even with us, during the times when our economy was growing, <coughs> if you look at what was happening, we were investing highly in infrastructure. Now, <coughs> from an environmental point of view, maybe just to touch on the two projects that we are working on here. Uh, there's actually two projects on the N1, maybe you might have seen them. So the, the one is actually an asphalt co uh, road. So basically what happened there is that we're going to remove a lot of asphalt and replace it, but now we have a lot of waste. So what we decided to do, we decided to give a restriction, meaning that we don't want to lose that asphalt. So the contractor there is forced to actually use 40% of that asphalt in the new asphalt. That's what we call reclaimed asphalt. So those are some of the in, in interventions that we are doing. And from the concrete point of view, and I think that's why you find that maybe people don't like investing in concrete, concrete because it's firstly expensive initial cost, but also once you start rehab rehabilitating the concrete, you have a lot of waste material, which in most cases you can't reuse on the road. And that's what's happening. But however, the benefit with it is that you have a very long life. You can actually have a road that lasts for over 50 years, but as long as you make sure that you maintain, you replace the joints and you replace all the defected slabs. Now, basically, luckily with us, we had farmers here who wanted the concrete to use it. Otherwise, it was going to be stockpiled in one of the interchanges. You see waste material as well. And then from a social point of view, I mean, in terms of the work that we do, it actually really impacts the communities a lot. I mean, through job creation, uh, the communities now start having infrastructure and more development come. If you look at probably what's happening in most of our rural areas, you'll start realizing that the big shops like ShopRite are opening new saves in a lot of rural areas. Why? Because now there's roads that are going to that area, meaning that they can safely t uh, transport goods to those areas. Now, that Magogo staying there does not need to catch a taxi and go 10 kilometers to town to go by they can just go in the backyard. Next slide, please. So yeah, my journey, uh, that was nine years ago when I started working at Sanva. So I went to site, worked in, as a resident engineer, assistant resident engineer, and then uh, worked as, as a design engineer, and now working as a project manager at Sanva. So just to give you a background. Next slide, please. So this slide, I actually just wanted to show you some of the works that we, or that I was working on when I was on site. So this is the project that I was in, in Bomalanga, F570. So basically we're upgrading the road, widening the bridges. So within Sanral itself, I think the regional manager has tried to highlight, we have a lot of subfields, meaning that a lot of specialization. We don't just do civil or roads in particular. So you find that you have bridges, uh, uh, bridge engineers, we need water engineers to do analysis. But one thing I just wanted to highlight here is now, in terms of our laws, we need a water utilization license to work on a river course. We didn't have a water utilization license. The project was going to site on the picture on the bottom left. Now what we had to do, we had to come up with a system so that we don't delay the project because the time to apply for a license from the Department of Water Affairs takes a lot of time. Now we decided to work with the cantilever system. So those are some of the interventions from an engineering point of view that you need to come up with to try and make sure that we do not delay the project. Next, next slide. So in summary, engineering is basically risk management. If you look at the code of conduct at, uh, at EXA, you realize that you can actually lose your profession should you probably build uh, maybe a building and then it collapses and then people dies. Because what we do has a direct impact to the users, the community. So this is basically what I uh, wanted to highlight with this slide. So uh, the road to success is always in construction. Yes. Uh, now, in terms of the engineering field itself, 
you'll actually start realizing when you go to work that it's actually still white male dominated and it's something that I think as time goes on, you know, we talk about transformation, having more women, having more people of color in the industry. But one thing maybe from my experience that I can share is you actually find that maybe on site, the RE on the site I was working on, it was a white old man. Already I get there, I'm a young black person. There's cultural divide. We, we, uh, oh. I hope you had me the whole time I was speaking. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. So you find that there's actually a culture divide. Um, you know, uh, old, young, you know, we don't see things the same way. So I think those are the things that you're going to meet, you know, and that's why you need to start learning or contentizing yourself about diversity because at the end of the day, it is upon you to make sure that you get the experience that you need and for you to be able to register and for you to be able to grow within the profession itself. Next slide. So in closing, as Steve Jobs said, uh, what I wanted to, to say is engineering is a solution to all the things that are happening. If you look at what's happening currently, we have a lot of low shading. We need engineers to sort out those things. Water shading, I think I heard that it's a new term that's used. We need engineers to solve those. You know, uh, last, last time, I think it was a week or two weeks ago, sometime this month, a bridge fell in Paza. You know, what do we need? Engineers to solve those things. So everything, uh, the trains are not functioning. We need engineers to solve it. So most of our problems, we just need to make sure that we develop more technical people so that we ensure that we have services or infrastructure that's working. Thank you. Thank you, Origin. And next slide, please. Now to hear from another young engineer uh, in Sanral, um, I call on Tony Siluani. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, I think from this side, um, please allow me to simply say protocol observed, but also allow me to acknowledge the presence of um, the most prestigious group in society, um, our students. My name is Tony Salwana, and as they've already mentioned, I am also um, a project manager at Sanral, and I will be sharing with you um, my journey from when I graduated university up until now as a well-seasoned um, civil engineer. So this is where my journey started. Um, I'm, I'm a project manager currently, so I manage a couple of um, projects within our Northern Region Network. Um, yes, I graduated with exemption, so as soon as you hear someone mentioning the word exemption, you know that their metric year is years back, so I am a bit advanced in, in years. And then um, after graduating metric, I got awarded a bursary from Sandral, and that is what actually made my journey through university a lot simpler and a lot easier. And then um, I obtained my bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Johannesburg. And then after, after graduation, I got absorbed into Sandral as a trainee project engineer or a trainee civil engineer at the time. And then, um, so Sandral has what we call, or they have signed what we call a commitment and undertaking with the Engineering Council of South Africa. And that is their commitment to the industry to say we will develop um, the, the, the young engineers to a point where they are well seasoned. So oh, that is what happens. And then part of the requirement is that you be allocated a mentor who is um, well advanced in their career in civil engineering. So that's what happened. Um, I got allocated a mentor within Sandral to help me through my journey as a civil engineer. Next slide, please. So in terms of my career development, just a small background. I've already mentioned the commitment and undertaking. So um, 
in, in, in the commitment and undertaking, there is a structured training plan um, that is uh, formulated within, uh, within Sandral, and we get to follow that particular training plan. And, but then before you go through the training plan, you have to first register as a candidate engineer with um, the Engineering Council of South Africa. And also the issue of an in-house mentor I've already mentioned. And in the training plan, we had to follow a set um, program, which started um, at, a, at an engineering survey company. That's where we gained our knowledge um, in, in survey in road survey, and then we were um, we moved to the engineering lab, an engineering materials lab, and then from there we went through to site. That's where we got to see the physical work being done um, from the design office, the physical work being implemented, and then I went to an engineering design office. That's the, the way you learn how to um, to produce a proper design using proper standards and proper um, specifications and then I came back home um, to manage a number of projects which is what I am doing currently and then throughout the entire um, training journey there was a mentor at each and every phase so that also helped me quite a lot um, to be the person that I am um, eventually or the person that I became eventually and then um, that also involved regular reporting. So every single month, you'd go back to your mentor and actually report on what you have been doing. And they get to weigh and measure your proficiency in whatever area you will be reporting on um, at that time. Next slide, please. Yes. So. Um, there is also what we call a, sp a specialization route. You, you, you will realize that civil engineering is quite broad. So there's different um, disciplines within civil engineering, and I've mentioned them there. Um, your geotechnical engineering, your transportation, your structures, and so on and so forth. So I, during my training, I developed the love for the art of designing structures, and I, I put more focus on, um, on, on structures. And then I got um, seconded to a number of civil engineering firms, consulting firms, where I got to refine my knowledge and my expertise in structural engineering. And then um, also in my training in structural engineering, I also um, I got to um, recognize the connection between structural engineering and geotechnical engineering because all of those loads that you are designing, where are you transferring them to? You need to. Um, um, to find the connection between structures and geotechnical engineering, and that's where my love for both structures and geotechnical engineering was developed. And then, um, yeah, that's when I decided that I, I'm going to forget about everything and focus on structural engineering. And then, um, after all um, the training was done, I decided, or I felt that I was ready, to then send through my application f to be registered as a professional engineer. And in 2018, I um, became a registered professional engineer with the South African, I mean, with the Engineering Council of South Africa. And then because I had already um, decided on what route I want to follow, which is structural engineering, and then enrolled for a Master of um, Engineering with specialization in structures with the University of Cape Town. And that is currently underway. Um, next slide. Yes. So um, throughout my my journey and my career growth, there are certain lessons that you pick up um, uh, throughout the journey. And the first one is that you cannot, even if you wanted to, um, you cannot function in isolation. You cannot work alone. You are not an island. So at the stage where you are now as students, you need to please. Um, make sure that you improve your skill. It is a skill to want to um, work as a team, so please work on that one. And then also take your time. Do not um, rush to specialize um, very early in your career. Take your time to understand where you want to go and where you actually, what it is that you want to specialize in. Like I said, civil engineering is very broad. And then um, develop 
the appetite for continuous learning. You do not stop learning um, even when you are past graduation years. You continue to learn because um, civil engineering or engineering as a whole is an ever-evolving discipline. So please develop the appetite for continuous learning. And also, um, in your learning, also understand the consequences of your decision. You will be put in a position where you have to make decisions, understand the consequences of um, those decisions. And lastly, know that anything, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. Things do go wrong on site, and um, with your eyes and ears on site, understand that you will need yours is to manage the risk of, um, of those failures. Last one, yeah, I think um, that was the last slide. Thank you so much. Um, it, it was such a privilege to actually be sitting here in front of you. Thank you and all of the best with your studies. Thank you, thank you, Tony. So I'm sure that your ears pricked up when you heard the word bursary. So SANREL is an organization that offers bursaries, and I'm going to ask Mr. Thatha to please come and run through a few slides to give you some more information about what SANREL bursaries are about. So I know you were hoping you had seen the last of me, yeah, but it seems I, I will talk to you a little bit. So thank you, I think, for the presenters, uh, Professor Ocheng, uh, Professor Khalid. Thank you as well for the opportunity. These slides are where most students wake up. So they generally sleep after the first slide, and then they wake up here. So I will talk quickly about what is available uh, in terms of the work we do. So we build roads, as we have indicated for a couple of times, but we don't only do bursaries for civil engineering. So you'll see, if you look there, we do electrical as well, or electronic, because we spoke a lot about ETO collection system. A lot of those is software and electronics that you need to work. We do environmental, because I think the colleagues spoke to you about structures, about permissions you need even to walk in the water where you want to build, even to abstract water to use for road building, there's special permissions you need the sensitive areas where you need to work, so you do need to have environmental people to assist you, so we do bursaries for those. We also have got human resources and to a very large extent procurement. So human resources, obviously, we have to work with a lot of people that you manage. You, if you are managing, if you are in a, in a mining sector and you're managing maybe semi-skilled people, you need a different set of skills to manage a lot of the Tonys and the origins. Because they are very clever. You make a decision, they will tell you, no, no, no. no. But that's not what the manual says. It says something different. So we need a, a lot of highly specialized uh, human resources people to be able to assist us with managing clever people like yourself. Because you, you do need to be managed in a different way than one would manage uh, maybe people who are less skilled. And we procure a lot. So we have got contractors and consulting engineers who do a lot of work for us. So we need people who are able to procure and do world best practice. You will be reading what the World Bank does, you will be reading what the EU does, what America does, and you will be bringing it to the South African context because a lot of the projects we run, some of them must be done with international bidders. You have seen the people working on the bridges, for example, they are not local. A lot of the companies are coming from other parts of the world and we are using international contracts, for example, FIDIC or FIDISH and a couple of others, NEC3, we don't use it yet, but it's another contract that is there and so on. So you would need people who understand some of these things to assist you with procurement. You can move to the next one. So you do need to kind of pass. <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you won't be able to do a 30% kind of thing. So just be mindful. Uh, on our website, you see a lot of information there, and those are the conditions that are there for you to be able to be eligible to get a bursary. We also do scholarships, I think, from grade 10 onwards and so on. But when you get to our website, you will see this information. You will see the application periods that are there. 
and then you'll be able to apply and then we'll evaluate internally. There obviously is a threshold. We're trying to assist those who are not able to fund their own, to pay their own fees to a very large extent. So there are thresholds around that. But just be mindful that although we understand from some of the journeys are different, you're not all going to get 100% and so on. You will have to make sure you achieve the things that we, we are saying there. So when you speak, if even to your uh, maybe young brothers, young sisters, they need to be aware of this. They do well, we'll be able to fund and support all those areas. In the areas we've mentioned, we're also looking at expanding them, depending on the need within Sandra for the people we, we actually fund. And we also have a training academy. Origin, Tony, they are know about this in uh, Port Elizabeth. I can't pronounce the new name now. It's a difficult uh, in the Port Elizabeth. You know Port Elizabeth? We have a training academy where you go, we have a whole system set up, all the software you require, all the seasoned engineers that you, you can work with. Um, as I think Origin spoke about it, a lot of them are senior white males with a lot of information that are willing to share and work with you. So we do push transformation, but we also make sure there's full integration. That's what I am trying to emphasize here. So you'll be able to come, you work with all sorts of races, all sorts of people, and they will train you on world best practice so that you are able to stand and to lead. You'll see uh, the two colleagues who they've touched on it. Once we, you are with Sandra, after a couple of years, we give you projects to run, and you must deliver on those projects. You are expected to make decisions, to make a call, to ask where you need help, and so on. So that's why we have this training academy, and we have five-year contracts we sign with everyone who joins where they train you and make sure that you register with EXA and you are prepared to be a lead engineer on all the projects we want you to run. We move to the next one. So the bursary kind of makes your life a lot easier. We, we cover a lot of things. So you, can, you stop worrying about the things most students worry about once you're on a standard bursary. So it's something that is it's like in pursuit so you need to make sure you get your grades right and you, you apply as quickly as that season opens. Because you can see, you don't have to worry about, obviously, tuition, that's a key thing. You don't worry about accommodation. We pay for your accommodation. We pay for your study material and all the equipment you require. We pay for your food. We even give you a living allowance so that when other people are buying, why do people buy these days? Okay, they're buying things, you also can buy things. Let's leave it like that. <laughs> and you, we, we have got uh, wellness programs we run. So you have access to that. And if you are struggling, both maybe the 60 and 70 percent is still a bit high, we are now uh, looking at tutoring services to get you to get the quality, to pass at the right level. And because a lot of people get killed, you, you live varsity, you get a lot of money, you buy a car and you want to show off how fast it is and you end up dying, we now have to pay for your driving licenses, a learner's license, to try and teach you the road safety culture as you go through your process. So that by the time you're ready to drive, you don't become a hazard to yourself and to others on the road. And there's information there, you can also sit on that side, uh, that we, we talk about. So. So it's usually June to September every year. So it, we are, it's, it's unfortunate we're in October now. Uh, okay, but next year we'll do better so that you can still apply. Some of you will still be here. And um, obviously we spoke about scholarships. Those are the email addresses you can use. But go to our website. You will see a lot of information there. We can move to the next one. Uh, a lot of information there that covers you in terms of what you need to do. Uh, this is for the... This is for the smart people now. So you are, you are ready to listen, eh? Yes, for the doctors and the profs to then take you through the, some of the, the opportunities that are there between the university and Sandra in terms of looking forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, that's been introduced uh, very well by uh, Progress Lasha. So, uh, Prof. Ochieng, I'm not sure whether it's you or Professor Cuthbert who will um, take the lead in terms of uh, speaking to us about the opportunities for, potential opportunities for collaboration between SAMREL and 
Paul University of Technology. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, give this one to you. I'll change. Uh, is it here? No, no. I'm talking about uh, the, the slide that I had. Oh, they're fetching it up. That's fine. Um, just as they fetch the, 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 the slides uh, to our okay. students, um, I think the, there's one thing, actually two things that was said by um, the second digital, um, Siloan. Yes, who mentioned two things that uh, you guys must be um, keeping in mind. And I'll not be afraid to mention it here. The one thing that he mentioned uh, about the elephant in the room, um, he said, the field is dominated by male white. Meaning that there is a lot of room for you guys to get in. But you're not going to get there with this kind of behavior. Where when we invite you to get information, you take your sweet time to come, or you don't come. You're not going to get that information. So you need to grab the opportunity, like this one here, with both of your hands. I'm hoping all of you have got both hands. You've got to grab this kind of opportunities. Don't let them slip, and then you go making noise out there. No. These are the little opportunities that pass you by as you sleep. They say you, you snooze you, you lose. So I, I, I'm, I'm saying I'm, a, I'm not just a bit, I'm very disappointed that uh, your brothers and sisters who would have been here to benefit from this talk are not here. And that is uh, disillusioning to myself and the organizers of the team. I, I said I'm not going to mince my words on that. Because I missed that, then I passed on the opportunity to rectify the situation as it is. So grab this opportunity. You're not going to get that information from anywhere else. Like even the training academy that now you're hearing about. Some of you probably are already thinking of what they want to do. But if you're not here, you don't get that kind of information. The second thing that he, the gentleman mentioned there is uh, having that culture of continuous learning. If, if you don't have this kind of, you don't have that continuous learning thing in your mind, you, you, you need to change your mindset. You need to, you need to twist your mindset. And when we say change your mindset, you're not saying that you now become rogue. No. Just about thinking smart. Think smart. And that is the kind of culture we're trying to inculcate into you guys. So, as they're preparing that, please ponder on the things that I've just mentioned. And I will, not, uh, I will not be shy to mention it anywhere else. Because you are our students and we need to tell you the right thing. You need to do the right thing. Whether in front of visitors or not. Because they're not going to be visitors anymore. They're going to be our partners. And therefore, they must learn the kind of people we are going to start working with. Is that understood? So please, uh, pull up your socks if you have any. If you don't have any, buy and pull them. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Um, mine is just basically an overview of um, what um, VUT civil engineering is all about and uh, what we envisage as uh, areas of cooperation. Uh, some of them, I think, have already been mentioned by um, uh, Mr. Hlatla, because he uh, talked about buzzwords, he talked about research, and those are the areas I wanted to, to talk about, but exactly in what field. Um, so, uh, please, let's go to the next slide. Good. That's uh, a little bit of a a map or a quick picture of how the Department of Civil Engineering and Building at the Valley University uh, looks like, the programs that we do offer. Uh, I remember one of the, the, the young engineers who were uh, 
talking here, asked me the first question when he arrived here. Is that um, uh, we, we thought you'd be offering BH Tech. But I think my answer to him was that, you know, as a university of technology, we first of all had to maintain our footprint. Our footprint uh, was more inclined towards um, technology uh, based uh, uh, education which in this case was to produce technologists and technicians. But then we are going there over time. You know, as time goes by, we grow our first, first of all, you have to grow what you have, and then you can have an add-on. So our BNG Tech is going to be an add-on, which we are busy working on uh, through my boss here, up, up, uh, my dean. I know it's part of my performance management uh, contract, um, uh, things that I have to fulfill as time goes by. So we offer at uh, the lower tier, which is the entry point, a diploma in civil engineering, which is a, a 360 um, qualification, 360 credits, uh, different from other universities. I think uh, so far in the country, uh, there are only two universities that offer 360 credit uh, 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 diplomas. That means that you have to have a, a work integrated learning component into it. Other institutions have tried to run away from the work integrated learning. And um, unfortunately, they can't um, even come to our institution to progress into the next step. So we've got work integrated learning, um, advanced diploma, which is uh, at 140 credits. Uh, at an NQF level 7, then uh, we go to the postgraduate diploma, and then um, the Master of Engineering in Civil Engineering, and then we have the Doctor of Engineering in Civil Engineering. So in terms of um, what we can do with Sunral or what we can gain from Sunral, of course, in terms of bursaries, um, you can see already we are fitting in there. Um, in terms of research, um, if you go look at the um, the um, offering or the, the 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 learning component, we got the theory, well, and research. So um, for diploma, there's no um, uh, research, but you've got the theory and the will. So if there are will opportunities, of course, you can gain uh, from a sunroll. Uh, advanced diploma, we've got the theory, and um, will is optional though, according to the Engineering Council standards. It's optional for, yeah, for those who want to go. <laughs> but um, we don't offer it as part of a mandatory um, requirement. But then there's a research component, which is mandatory. Okay? So our advanced diploma students have got a research component. Then um, the postgraduate diploma, of course, there's theory. There's no will. And there's a compulsory research component as well. Um, when it comes to masters, of course, no theory, no will, but research component. Uh, the same thing that we have with the Doctor of Engineering, which no theory, no will, but is research oriented. So uh, basically, that's a typical picture of what we have and the key areas of um, 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 touch base that we can have uh, with Sandra. Um, please, next slide. Now, as, as a department, uh, we've opted to is have uh, three uh, strong areas in, in research. I mean, I mean in, our, in our program. Um, are you able to blow it up a bit, please? Is it possible? OK. Good. Um, I hope that is uh, slightly uh, legible. You can, can view that now. So uh, the civil engineering, uh, when we're having designs, project, and research clusters, we've got three major clusters. Uh, one of them is um, uh, the um, uh, structural engineering cluster, which is cluster one. Then we've got cluster two, which is transportation engineering. And then the third cluster is water and environmental engineering cluster. And um, each of these, uh, we've got the th what we're calling the specific thematic outcomes. And um, for a structural, we talk about applying research methods and techniques in civil engineering, design, synthesis, and analysis. 
we do the same for um, uh, transportation and as, as for water as well. But then the outcomes in terms of the final product are different. Um, if we come slightly down, please, down the slide. Good. Now, our key, um, I would say the flag of our cooperation with Sunral would basically be stemming through the, the, the middle cluster, which is the transportation engineering. But that one doesn't stop structural guys from coming in. Neither does it stop the water guys from coming in. That's why you see those ones are dotted, they're dotted lines. But the key one is on the transportation. The last gentleman we talked here was a structural um, specialist, but he's still working with Sunwell. So those are areas that you can still collaborate in. And you can start as early as advanced diploma, given that they have research component. You know, those, those little introductory research components, you know, material testing here and there. Then you go to the postgraduate diploma. And then, of course, now more advanced uh, research at master's and, and doctorate, uh, doctorate level. And uh, we, are, we, we, we are envisaging at least uh, a center of excellence, or what we're calling a research chair, that we could have within, within the institution. Because um, we, 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 the way we are located as, as a university, University of Technology, uh, we are at uh, a point whereby we, we, we can leverage on our positioning to uh, take advantage of what is taking place to be having a center of, a center of excellence in materials testing specifically, or smart materials, working on research on, 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 on uh, materials. So we're talking about applied materials research. Um, we're also thinking of having an accredited material testing center within uh, our institution. Um, talking about smart transportation infrastructure and we can also leverage on skilling and upskilling those who are already in the field through the short learning programs. And if these are accredited uh, through maybe your academy, uh, we could have some of those devolved down to just uh, typical short learning programs. And we could co-present some of these programs so that uh, we become a center as well or an extension or maybe um, a, a branch of or your, your current center so that whatever you're doing there, through your supervision and accreditation of what we're doing here, we could have here as a short learning program center for your, uh, as an extension of some of the programs that you're offering there. So in a nutshell, basically that's uh, how we envisage to operate with you. But uh, I know we'll have a, a meeting to uh, thrash out the bigger picture of what we expect to work uh, with Sandra uh, moving forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Achieng, for that food for thought. Did I say Achieng? Uh, my, my, my deepest apologies. It was a slip of the tongue, Professor Achieng. Um, could we go back to the other presentation? Yes, very good. And the next slide, please. Wonderful. Thank you. So. Um, you heard me mention SAISI at the very beginning, and it gives me great pleasure to invite Sbongile Mamatu, a wonderful young lady from SAISI, to talk to you about the benefits of membership of this uh, organization. Sbongile. Well, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I think you can. Um, I'm going to keep mine very brief, but I'm going to try to just impart some knowledge with you for about SICE. So please go to the next slide. In a nutshell, I am Swangi Lemamadu. I hold a BCom Honours in Marketing Management, and I am a marketing specialist at SICE. SICE stands for the South African Institution of Civil Engineering. Okay. Um, please go to the next slide. So as SICE, we are a voluntary association. So we exist to just be able to be a learned society for civil engineers, for technicians, and technologists. It's just to make sure that we are improving um, your knowledge, and then we're just um, having um, improvement of the civil engineering space itself. Please go to the next slide. 
So our mission, as I've said already in the, next, in the previous slide, we exist to advance professional knowledge. And then we also have partnerships with um, the South African, the South African, oh, no, Engineering Council of South Africa, which is EXA. And that helps us with the partnerships that we have um, with them. Please go to the next slide. Okay. I think I won't touch on the slide because the engineers in the room have um, already communicated how important civil engineering is. So it's just for me to go into the benefits of joining SICE. Go into the next slide, please. As SICE, we have a variety of member categories. So these categories consist of civil engineers, technicians, and technologists. And we have corporate members who are members there growing their career and networking and giving back. We have divisions, and these divisions um, consist of structural divisions. We have a water division. We have um, an ISC division. So all of the engineering spaces, we have divisions that are different that house these different civil engineers in. And then we also have branches that are in different regions. They also have a lot of civil engineers within. And it's just to assist members to be in a space that has the people that are going to help them with their career development. Please go to the next slide. Thank you. I want to just focus on the six, which is the student chapters, and it's about you guys. So we exist to make sure that the future engineers are actually catered for more than anything. So all the partnerships that we have is just to ensure that it is professional development of young engineers because we want to break the mold, as it was already um, said, that the people that are in civil engineering are older and they're also um, a white dominant space. So we just want to make sure that the young en engineers that are coming in are younger, they are black, and we want to just make sure that we have opportunities for you guys. Please go to the next slide. So the benefits that we have for student members specifically is that you have free SICE membership. So you don't pay for membership. You have free student-focused webinars. You heard that you need to always be CPD accredited. So you need to always be learning, um, developing your career. So we give you these webinars for free, especially for students. But then obviously, as you progress in your career, you'll start paying for them. <laughs> um, we also give bursary assistance to about 30 students per semester. So this is a SPEPS bursary. You find it on our website, where so when you join SICE and then you just um, go to the membership space, you become a member, then you will have access to the SPURBS bursary. It assists students a lot, um, so if you want to go into it, just go onto our website and you'll be able to see all the benefits for it. Another benefit that we have is that we assist with EXA regulations and accredita accreditation procedures. So through our relationship with EXA, and through the webinars that we have, because they are all EXA accredited, we ensure that all the information that you get is relevant and it's also going to be helpful for your career as you develop. So when you start as a student, it helps you keep consistent as you go through your career. And then the last one that we have are networking. And so you, you network opportunities. That's where you're going to actually um, grow as a civil engineer. Um, and then for that, we have SICE Connect. Please just go to the next slide. So SICE Connect is free as well for students. You just have to create a profile and you are able to then get in touch with mentors. So these are people who have been in civil engineering uh, for a very long time and they're, a they're able to be there to help you. Um, and when you start having a mentor from a young age, it actually helps you progress better than most of your peers. So through SICE Connect, we offer you that. And then through it as well, we still have internships. So when you have a mentor, then it's easier for you to have access to all of these other companies that we have in our space. And most of them have um, internships that they give to students. And then also, they, when you start in your career, there's always career opportunities, but only if you are around um, people who are communicating about these opportunities. So through SICE Connect, we offer you that. And then we also have a WhatsApp group for students that we offer all these opportunities in. So we communicate, we have all of the engineers that are in our fold, and they actually post these jobs and all these opportunities where you can actually advance your career within these WhatsApp groups. So please go to the next slide. We are on social media, of course. So if you are not a SICE member, just please um, follow us. And then there's also gonna be um, 
a QR code that you can actually scan for you to be able to have um, easier access and then join us in the journey because we are there to just help you grow your career. Okay, thank you so much and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Spongile. And um, now we can go back to the, or you can just uh, go to the next slide. Okay, so I don't know if we want to tempt the naughty Tikoloshi inside the computer <laughs> by trying to play another, another video. So we do have a, a, a road safety video, but maybe, maybe we should just uh, not tempt fate for now. Shall we try? Okay, let's go. No, 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 wrong direction. It's the, it's the one after where it says road safety message. You need to go down, 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 down. After the orange slide, you need to go to an orange slide. Next one, no, down, down, continue. Down, down, down. That orange slide, the black one after it. That one, exactly, that's a road safety video. Can we play that? Press enter. In a country of over 54 million people, there is no one quite like you. Ready for school? Yeah. That's you, the number one. Now, do the one thing that will keep us all safe on our roads. So that you can continue the journey of your life. No, thank you. The journey of the number one. It worked. Fantastic. Thank you. So, as you've heard all through the presentation, SAMREL's mandate is the building, the management, the maintenance of the road network in this country. But obviously, the importance of the road users is not lost in this picture. Road safety engineering is a key focus for SANREL, but so is the road safety of the users. And your age group, unfortunately, makes up the largest population of injuries and fatalities on our roads. Road safety message home to you. So you are number one. Do the one thing always. Keep yourself safe. We need engineers like you. The country needs engineers like you. Your families need you. Your mothers and fathers and children also need you. So please be safe on our roads. Okay, let's move on to the next slide now. And I think it's question time. Are there any questions that are burning um, inside any of you that you would desperately like to ask? I see the gentleman uh, with a hand up over there, please. For any one of our panelists. Uh, thank you. you. Stand up and please introduce ourselves. Tell us which year you're in and what your field of study is. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nkule Mkuba. Uh, I'm a postgraduate diploma, a student currently doing my uh, second semester. So uh, we are honored and privileged to have visitors such as Sandra. Um, Sandra plays a bigger role in the country and is set and we can see it's an efficient and um, a good entity to have. Um, however, I would also like to share some of my concerns or some of the things which has been said here in relation to how Sandra does his, some of the things and we are concerned about. So I wrote some of my questions as you were presenting, and uh, some may 
they might sound somehow, but they are responding or questioning um, from the presentation. Firstly, uh, the issue of user pay system, your collection system of, uh, in particular, eTolls. That issue, when eTOL started, I remember it was, I think, 2014. And it, when I calculated in my budget or oh, the travel I took and the first invoice from Sunrail, it was about like 2,000 rand. So it means I would have added an extra 2,000 rand on my unbudgeted little amount that I get. So really, the ETOL system was not a, a just system. We're not opposed to um, a collection system or an infrastructural fund. But if Sandral can persuade things such as maybe a different model of collection, maybe like fuel levies and others. Because it's, it sounded controversial on its own that you want to only build people of Gauteng. How about other people who uses these roads throughout the, who come and interchange throughout the networks of Gauteng? So the collection model, perhaps Sandra should go back to Treasury and engage them to say, people cannot afford e-tools. They are expensive, and it cannot only come at the back foot of people of Gauteng. So, and thanks to the Premier of Gauteng for uh, engaging you guys to say, at least maybe we must put a pause or an end to them and find another alternative model of funding these networks. They are important. Uh, maybe it could be a question to say, why can Sarral persuade other alternative uh, modes? Uh, the other one was that. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, can, can you make it a little bit more concise, yeah. your next question? And then I will ask uh, Mr. Thatha to respond to you on the first one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is that, why is Sandral taking long to fix the sinkholes? Is it a procurement issue or what? And another thing is, uh, another thing is, when was the last time Sandra built a, a freeway, a new freeway, or a national road? Okay. I think we're going to limit your questions because you've already asked three questions there and there are many other people um, in the room. So I'm going to ask Mr. Thatla if he would like to, um, if he'd like to respond to your, to your questions um, and then I will take the mic afterwards to, carry, to continue. All right, uh, it's Ngululeko. So thanks, you, you touched on a, quite a number of interesting points there. Um, so the Ito horse has bolted. I think the decision has been made and we are abiding by the decision. The system will be switched off at some point in the future and we will then look at alternative ways to look at funding the roads. So, the, so that debate has bolted. But maybe to correct a couple of things you said which may not be correct. So you, you would all be aware that the cost for using the G5 system was kept at 250 rands a month. So it would be impossible for you to have received a bill of 2,000 unless it was maybe because of previous months you would have traveled the system without paying. So it, it's an important thing we, maybe that maybe was missed in all the communication. You, you wouldn't use fuel levies as a source of funding for a couple of reasons. The first one is vehicles are becoming more efficient in terms of the liters per 100 kilometers. The people with older vehicles who to some extent might be the poorer people who cannot change their cars regularly. 
are the ones who have vehicles who, who use more fuel, or which use more fuel, which means that the poor people must then subsidize the rich people because of the fuel levy, because the fuel levy is, ma is per liter, isn't it? So if you try to use a fuel levy, this is one of the problems you run into. You will charge the poor more than you charge the rich. The second thing is people are getting hybrid cars. They're also getting electrical vehicles. So if you start to migrate in that direction, then the fuel levy starts to become less relevant. So, so all this, so there were a lot of options we looked at and a lot of things we, so we won't have time to go into all of this. But what I can assure you is a lot of smart people put a lot of their time to try and solve this problem. But in the end, we must respect the political decision that is made and that actually then will be implemented. So in summary, the ETO horse has bolted, a decision has been made, it will be, I think it will be finalized as soon as the agreement between uh, the Hauteng province and Treasury in terms of the funding model goes. And it also will be interesting to you that the GFI phases two and three are not owned by Sandra, they are owned by Houtrans. So the funding of those, that network you require, is, I think will get the guidance from the province in how they want it funded going forward. So we, we, I think that that is the short answer to you. But the maybe just also correct a few things. The network, as I indicated earlier, was set up that any vehicle, whether domestic or foreign, that traverses the network would actually pay. So it's not only Hauteng residents. It's a user pay as in using the freeway, not Hauteng. But anyway, maybe let's not go into that. Long debate. So singles. So, um, yeah. How many, how many hours do you, do you have for me to respond to him? <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I'm gonna, oh, okay, I'll, I'll respond quickly. So, I debated in coming today to put, whether I wanted to put a few slides on the singles so that you appreciate the complexity of solving the single problem. But if you drive in Hauteng today on the N1 single, you will see already there are people working there. I don't know if you have been there recently. We have people working there. We'll be, we have people working on the other 21 single, uh, I think within a week or two from now. We are actually finalizing the awards, so that those will be, will be repaired. The, maybe for some of you who are interested, yo, this will take it. Okay, I'll shorten it. So singles are like a funnel. Funnel, uh, you follow my thing. A funnel, and they have what we call a throat. And so you, I, the idea with solving singles is you need to choke the throat and then build back up so that the material doesn't fall further down. So when you are trying to do it under live traffic, you, in addition to the vertical loading you have, uh, you have done your material, isn't it? Your material science, your ohms, ohms circles, and so on. Remember those stresses? That's why I was saying it would take time to explain this thing. But so think of it as there's vertical pressure, but there's also horizontal pressure. Uh, you agree? If you, have, if you are de dealing with soil, if you have vertical loading and you've got live traffic, so you've got variable loading here, and you want to fix part of a road, you need to do something about the horizontal pressure before you can dig. You agree? You are all following what I'm saying. Eh? It's not too complex. I, I think this is the simplest I can do. So you need to do piling. So you, 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 you need, either you can end, end bearing or side bearing, whatever, but you, you, or friction piles, but you do a lot of piling. Then you do soil angles or angles that are almost horizontal to resist the, the pressure, like you would do with a retaining wall. But you're using piles as your part of your retaining wall, and then you anger it sideways. And then you dig and you hope the equipment you bring does not vibrate the single too much so that you end up with that throat enlarging, enlarging and everything falling into the ground. So you also do a lot of testing. You've got gravity surveys. You've got even boreholes you drill. So it will, it takes, it will take me a, quite a while to take you through the path to the solution. So it takes time, and there's a lot of testing, a lot of sensing that you need to bring in, a lot of different type of models you run eventually you i think I'll, I'll bring in the future i'll bring you the slides to deal with that so that's why it takes long the design aspect of solving these singles takes long 
Once it's done, then we procure. But remember, all these singles we are talking about, they are on the network that is toll funded, which requires money. And remember we spoke a little bit about the problem with funding there. And then new roads, uh, we are building new roads, but a lot of the new roads maybe are not yet this side, but some of them you will see. But again, it comes back to funding. So we are building new roads around the country. Maybe in future I'll bring a few slides, uh, Sora, that will just show you the amount of work we are doing and the cost it, it, uh, it's actually on. Yeah, maybe after this thing, see me, I'll explain to you the single thing. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I see a hand over here. Are there any other hands that can go after? Okay. Could you stand up and introduce yourself? Let us know which year you're studying and what discipline, please. Is the mic on? Yeah, it's now on. Uh, my name is Nkosi Nati Sibanda, and I'm doing my second year. Uh, I think Mr. Singwana touched on asphalt and resurfacing of roads. My question was on the sustainability part. Are there any other solutions that are being implemented rather than farmers taking the concrete and reusing 40% and the regulations? Are there any other solutions besides that? Because I feel like it's not much. Okay. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Siluan. Uh, thanks for the question, but yeah, there's there's a lot of research that's taking place in terms of the type of surfacings to use on, on our roads. But to, to cut it short, um, uh, remember now, with concrete, due to the initial cost that we spend to do it, the idea is we, 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 we're trying to reduce, there's actually not a lot of concrete roads that are taking place at this point in time because firstly they're expensive. But number two, if you research, you'll also note that there's actually reuse of concrete in other aspect, uh, meaning that you can reuse that concrete if you crush it, but for non-structural concrete works, meaning that let's say in a park, you can do a walkway with that concrete, you reuse it. So I think the whole idea that we are doing in terms of sustainability is just reuse it. The asphalt, as an example, if we take it out, the asphalt plants actually take it and they every concrete that uh, asphalt that comes most of it is actually uh, reclaimed it's just that uh, they, they do a design and normally uh, use 20 percent in summer but one way or another the material is being reused in in the works that we are, we are doing i don't know if it's making sense No, no, it goes to the Ashford plant. Uh, National Ashford, Marsh Ashford, and then they reuse it in new uh, uh, Ashford that comes uh, on, on the other roads. So basically, if now you are doing a road here, you buy Ashford from that plant, they take that material that we took out and they add it back into that uh, Ashford, basically. So it's an ongoing cycle of reusing the material. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can take one more question because we are well over time. And so um, is there a last question or we can always have more questions as we uh, mingle and network over, over lunch? Um, so no last question. Oh, there, 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 is, oh, there, there is, is a one. question. Oh, I see. Uh, but uh, thanks for the wonderful, uh, my voice. You will, you will correct me if I'm asking the correct question or either it is relevant. But mine is, what has been the investment of Sandral towards the issue of load sharing in SA? And also, if any uh, load sharing has any impact towards the, your services towards the country? Thank you. I'll give that to Mr. Sasha. <laughs> OK. Um, you guys ask questions that get me excited, and I forget that we are out of time. Okay, so we, there's a little bit of a, maybe not a little bit, but there's a, a challenge regarding freight on, on rail. 
you, you agree with me, especially if you are trying to move coal to the coal plants and so on. So our contribution has been a lot on road building, but a lot of our roads are suffering because of that. But if I don't know if I get your, got your first question correctly, but in terms of actual impact on Sandra, it is quite extensive because we a lot of our, our freeway system relies on electricity. All the things we, we showed earlier, it's electricity. And if you rely on continuous supply of electricity to dispatch people to, there's a golden hour. If you have an accident, the first hour, we call it a golden hour, is where people need to intervene to save life. Once outside of that golden hour, it becomes much harder to keep you alive. So if the systems are constantly either losing power or the power coming back, you burn a lot of things because a lot of equipment is sensitive to these outages. And so you need proper backup systems that cost you money that you could be using elsewhere to create all these systems to then try to have an interrupted power supply and so on. So it has a material impact because of the nature of the work we do, especially around road safety, around the lighting we require on freeway systems. And, but internally for our buildings, we have generators, some we've got solar panels and so on as backup systems, so we try to manage it that way. But our contribution maybe is to make sure the road network is drivable so that coal can get to the plants it needs to get because now we cannot use rail because of the challenges we are having. Let's keep it high level like that for now. Thanks. Thank you very much. You can pass to the last slide. And at this point, um, I'd like to call on Professor Khaled to say a few words to close the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, students and uh, guests. I'm sure it's not uh, the last visit, so they will visit us again. Uh, I, ha I have got one question. You didn't give us the chance. <laughs> Those who are doing masters, what inspired you to do masters while you are working? Can you share that with the students? My point is that this is not the end of life when you are done with your diploma or degree. Life must be about continuously getting into learning. So can you just share that with us, any, any one of you? Yeah. So they all have masters, so one of them. <laughs> Okay, um, for me, it was, um, like I mentioned, I developed the love for structural engineering um, in my career. So when you do that, you will realize that um, your basic degree only gave you the basics of structural engineering. And for you to actually excel in that, um, in that subject, in that division, you need to um, take on a study that focuses primarily on structural engineering and actually um, study advanced methodologies in dealing with structures. So that's what motivated me to actually pursue um, a postgraduate degree in that particular um, subject. You get to focus on that subject for the entire year, unlike when you are a student. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. No, that's fine. So I actually didn't mention my area of speciality. So I'm in pavement engineering on my side. So similar to him, you you realize el, uh, when you get to the workplace you, that you actually know nothing. Whatever you did in varsity, it's nothing when you get to the workplace because you start learning how to do the designs properly when you get to site uh, site or the office. So s similarly, the whole idea in terms of going to pursue postgrad was to firstly learn more and be able to specialize and on top of that I actually also wanted to contribute because the research that I'm doing it's something that's going to benefit uh, the industry as a whole so those are my motivation factors in terms of going to do masters okay for me I think it's the same thing we or rather, when you're a manager, it's hard to lead people with masters if you don't have one. So, <laughs> so you, 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 you get a couple and then everyone starts getting a master's. So I'm going to talk to you, Prof. Uh, maybe a doctorate somewhere. It's bad now. 
This is what I wanted to say, that you guys, you can get doctors and you can come to VUT. So we can borrow you from, from Sanral. Then you can produce more engineers for Sanral. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, really want, I want really to, to echo what uh, Prof. HOD, the head of the department, uh, concern. Now I'm speaking to you as, uh, as an educator. Yes, uh, online has spoiled somehow the students, but the students misunderstand the online means of, of learning. It's just a means, but really important, the communication with, with the experts, with the professors is really important and inspires you. So online is a means that you must use when you, when you learn. But try to come to campus, try to talk to people, try to talk to the engineers. Okay, thank you very much uh, again, uh, Mr. Tlal. Uh, we appreciate the time that you have spent with us today and uh, to the students. I hope that you have benefited something from, from, the, from today's function. All the best to everyone. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm not supposed to talk after my boss. But, uh, okay, I'm a bit uh, pedantic at times in my thought. I just wanted to find out, is there a formula in terms of the naming for one to work in uh, Sanra? Uh, there was an origin, and now there's um, um, uh, progress. So I'm looking, I don't know what comes after progress, so that uh, maybe I name my child or, or I name my or success. So if you... If you're called success, you probably will be able to work in Sandra. Thank you very much. Um, we, now invite, we now invite you to join us over a finger lunch on the patio just outside the hall. Thank you very much for your participation, and we hope that it's been beneficial to you. Thank you very much. Tengo